morning, everyone. Today is Monday, January 11th, 2010. This is the 11th day of 2010. There are 354 days left in this year. On this day in history, January 11th, 1935, aviator Amelia Earhart began a trip from Honolulu to Oakland, California, becoming the first woman to fly solo across the Pacific Ocean. Also on this day in 1757, American founding father Alexander Hamilton was born in the West Indies. In 1805, the Michigan Territory was created. On this day in 1861, Alabama seceded from the Union. On this day in 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General Luther Terry issued the first government report saying smoking may be hazardous to one's health. And on this day in 1973, owners of American League baseball teams voted to adopt the, the designated hitter rule. That was in 1973. Those are some of the events that have taken place on this day in history. The weather for Wausau today cloudy, then gradually becoming mostly sunny with a high near 24. Tonight mostly clear with a low around 2. Tuesday sunny with a high near 24. Tuesday night mostly clear with a low around 13. And then on Wednesday sunny with a high near 33. Currently in Wassa, overcast skies, 20 degrees above zero, a wind chill of 9 above zero at 8.59. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio, a brand new week and a brand new book of the Bible. We're going to be studying 2 Thessalonians today and tomorrow. It's only a short book, only three verse or three chapters, I should say, so we'll cover it in two days. We begin today in chapter 1, verse 1. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. But first, the views and the opinions of this program are solely the views of myself and may not be the same as that of our management group, the Friends of WNRBLP, or our owners, the Wassa Area Hmong Mutual Association. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Father, we pray and ask your blessings on this study. We pray that you will do what you say you will do, and that's not allow your word to come back to you void, but you will accomplish whatever you have in mind. And I pray that you do that today. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. It reads, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God is our Father. If you are a Christian, God is your Father. That's what the Bible teaches. God is everyone's Creator, but He is the Father of all Christians, because in Christ we are adopted into the family of God. Now, He is our God, so we owe our life to Him, but He is also our Father, and He's a good Father. He always wants what is best for us. Verse 2, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way to be at peace with God, and that is by putting our faith in the death of Christ, which paid for our sins. We have peace with God, the Bible says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, 
We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. In other words, these Christians, who this letter was originally written to, they were going in the right direction spiritually. And God deserved all the credit. It is by the grace of God that Christians are not what they used to be. If we are better than what we used to be, it is because God has been working on us. That is the only way it happens. Verse 4. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And that is the sign of a healthy Christian. Christians should not ever go out, go out looking for trouble. We should live holy lives. We should be kind and good and speak the truth in love. And you know what? If we do, trouble will come to us. That's a sign of a healthy Christian. And enduring those troubles and persevering in our faith in the midst of them is also a sign of a healthy Christian. And these Thessalonian Christians did not give up when the Christian life became hard. If the Word of God is true, and it is, and we really believe it, then we will endure whatever it takes to hang in there with Jesus. Verse 5. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Enduring hard times for Jesus is a sign that we are saved. Not quitting on Jesus, even when it would be more comfortable right now if we did, is an indication that we belong to Christ and therefore will go to heaven after we die. Verse 6. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. In other words, God will not allow, He won't let anyone get away with hurting His children. God will punish them, maybe in this life, for sure after they are dead, if they don't repent and find forgiveness through Christ themselves, which they can. And which is really what God wants, not just for them, but for all people. Verse 6 and then verse 7. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. And give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. Any suffering that comes from serving Christ is only temporary. Any suffering that comes from living the way Jesus wants us to live is only temporary. Any suffering from rejecting Christ, however, is permanent. Any good times you experience by rejecting Christ is only temporary. The good times you will experience for being true to Christ will last forever. So really it boils down to this. Do you want to enjoy life? Let me put it this way. That's, that's the wrong way to say it. If you're a Christian today, living for the Lord, there will be sacrifice, there will be suffering. But the good will come later. And it will never end. So it really boils down to this. Are you willing to sacrifice the now for eternity? That's what Christianity calls for. 
last part of verse 7. Well, actually, let's read the first part as well. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. God will make things fair when Jesus returns. Jesus Christ is going to bust through the clouds with guns ablazing, as it were, to save the good and to punish the bad. You know, when I when I grew up, I watched shows like Gunsmoke and The Rifleman, and there was some violence, just as there is violence today. But the thing is, and, and I'm not an expert on, on shows today. I, I just really don't watch television. Um, but back in those days, like for The Rifleman, for example, just a, some of you may remember that show. Great shot, you know, with his rifle. He had that fancy rifle, didn't even have to pull the trigger. All you had to do was cock it, and it fired automatically. And, and of course, he could, you know, he could, he could shoot the fly off a wall. Um, but, you know, in, in an upstanding moral individual, him and his son, Mark, And the only time he used that rifle was to defend the weak and to help those who were in trouble. And that's how Jesus is returning. He's coming back to save the good and punish the bad. Verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. In other words, God will punish those who refuse to repent. He is going to punish those who refuse to repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They have disobeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thereby they have sealed their own eternal doom. He will verse eight again, he will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. God says he's going to punish those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. That means they've refused to repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction And shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Look at what he says. Those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who refuse to repent, in other words, and make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. That doesn't mean annihilation. Destroyed is a quality of life, not life itself. Everlasting punishment. You know that hell is everlasting punishment? Do you know that's what the Bible teaches? The bad thing about hell, according to Jesus, is the burning, the weeping, according to Jesus, the wailing, according to Jesus, the gnashing of teeth, according to Jesus. The bad thing about hell is all that. The other other bad thing about hell is that all that will never stop. Ten. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people, And to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you. Because you believed our testimony to you. If you believe. You will be happy to see Jesus. You will marvel at his coming. If you put your faith. In Jesus Christ. You put your faith in his death on the cross. That paid for your sins. Then seeing Jesus Christ. Will be the greatest experience. That you will ever have. It is not something to shrink back from. It is something to rejoice in and something that you are going to be thrilled with. Verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you 
that our God may count you worthy of his calling. And of course, we will never be worthy of salvation. But our life as a Christian should be in line with what God has called us to be. And that would be holy. And so he says in verse 11 again, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. If you're a Christian, truly a Christian, then you will want to do good things for God. You will have good purposes, as verse 11 says. You're going to have good purposes. But those good purposes often don't happen. They don't come to pass without the help of prayer. 12. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The good things that we do as Christians should be done for the glory of God. The good things we do as Christians should be done because we want to represent our God well. Our good works as Christians should never be done in order to draw attention to ourselves or make a name for ourselves or become famous or anything like that. And if we are close to Christ like we should be, then we're going to want him to get all the glory sincerely. And in fact, if we are complimented too much, we're going to feel uncomfortable about that. Well, it is 9.14. That means it's time for our break. I'm going to take a one-minute break. Please listen to this. You are listening to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. This is By the Way. The Fort Hood shooting last year, other shootings that happen too often in our culture, and other violent and tragic incidents are reminders of how quickly and unexpectedly the end can come. It's not the kind of thing we want to think about too often, and it's not really necessary to dwell on such things if we are prepared. Plans for one's family, arranging for organ donations, a will or estate plan, and the like are good things, even for young adults. But more important than all those things is consideration of where you will spend eternity. eternity. No amount of planning, preparing, arranging, or playing the odds will do any good if those things are done apart from simple faith in Jesus Christ. With faith in Him, you are always prepared whenever the time may come. This is By the Way. With overcast skies and haze, it's 21 degrees in Wausau at 9.15. Welcome back to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and we are studying the book of Second Thessalonians today. And we resume our study in chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, now let's just stop there for a second. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, Jesus is returning. And when he does, all Christians from every generation will be raised and brought to him for a wonderful reunion. We're going to be gathered to him, everyone who knows him. And so we see from this that Jesus is not gone from good. He is returning. And no dead Christian is dead for good either. Look at verses 1 and 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. There were these false teachers saying, I've got a word from, the, from God. I've got a word from the Lord. The Lord spoke to me and said that Jesus has already returned. And there were Christians who were believing it. 
and it was very unsettling. It is important to keep our thoughts fixed tightly to the written word of God so that we are not shook up or led astray by the smooth or pious words of some false teacher, some false prophet, because there are plenty of them in the world today. Many people claim to have prophetic words from God, but there is only one prophetic word from God, and it's the Holy Bible. Forget the rest of that nonsense. Stick to the Word of God that you know is the Word of God. Verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, the day of the Lord, His return, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. In other words, he's saying that Jesus is not going to return until after the Antichrist is revealed. Look at verse 3 again. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. There is a massive rebellion against God coming, and it's going to be led by the Antichrist in the final days of this earth. But like all things which oppose God, that too will fail. It's not going to last. Because, you see, it doesn't matter how power, powerful an evil person is or how many evil persons are united in their sinful efforts. Their plans will come to a screeching halt. 4. Talking about the Antichrist, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The Antichrist will claim to be God. And he will not tolerate anyone giving their worship to anyone except him. And we know from the book of Revelation that he will rule the world. And he will have the power to withhold food and medical treatment. You know, the ability for people to buy, sell, and trade unless they bow down and worship him. Five. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. Evidently, they had forgotten what they had been told. They had forgotten the word of God that they had received. And that's why they were being deceived, because they forgot, see? Satan's deceptions are very powerful. And the only thing that can combat them is the word of God fresh in our minds. If we let the Word of God slip, the devil's deceptions are going to move in, sure enough. Verse 6, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. The devil thinks he's so smart, but he can't do anything without God's permission. God has Satan, demons, and evil people on a leash. 7. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Right now, Satan and evil in general are being held back. But the time is coming when God will let them loose. Sin will run rampant in the final days. God is going to let evil run its course. God will let the world gorge itself on the sin that it has always craved. He will not He will not restrain it in the final days. And you know what the amazing thing is? The Bible says, if those days were not cut short, no flesh would remain alive on this earth. That's how destructive sin is when it is not restrained. Verse 8, and then the lawless, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The Antichrist and all his willing followers will be destroyed by Christ, and it won't even be a contest. When Jesus returns, 
we are going to be gathered to him and at the same time he's going to destroy the devil the antichrist and all impenitent sinners verse 9 the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles signs and wonders the antichrist is going to be a miracle worker his miracles will be empowered by the devil in order to lead people astray caution never believe something is right or of God simply because it's supernatural the devil has powers and he uses them to deceive verse 10 let's read 9 along with it the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved and here's a red alert for you those who love their sin more than they love the Word of God will go to hell when a person hears the truth but hates it because it's a threat to their sinful life or it makes them feel uncomfortable in their sin so they reject it the Bible says here in verse 10 they will perish 11 for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie those who know truth but hate it and so reject it in favor of their sin will one day lose even their ability to discern truth that's a frightening thing God eventually gives evil people what they want and that's an eternity without him verse 11 again for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie everyone believes something if you do not like the truth because it makes you feel uncomfortable if you reject the truth then at some time you will come to believe that what's false is true you be as sincere as can be but you will be sincerely wrong and you will have hell to pay for refusing to repent and for rejecting God's Son. Now, if you still want to reject truth after, after seeing what God says about that, I'd say you are well on your way to believe in a lie. And this is a very urgent warning from God's Word to you. 11. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Who are those who are going to be condemned? Who are those who are going to hell? Those who have delighted in wickedness. They've delighted in it to the point where they refuse to believe the truth. If one delights in wickedness to the point that they reject the truth about their sin and God's punishment, they are destined to be condemned. If you have any questions for me, any comments, you can write me at Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, 54402-2211 or if you would rather email me you can do that I can be emailed at vbyvmm at aol.com that's vbyvmm at aol.com if you want more of the Word of God you can 
Study the entire Bible online for free with my audio Bible commentaries. Always free. It's there for you. And uh, that address is meret.org. Let me spell that for you. M-E-U-R-E-T-T dot O-R-G. Again, M-E-U-R-E-T-T dot O-R-G. Meret.org for the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And uh, if you're looking for a place to worship, you are welcome to join us this Sunday morning. We meet at 10 o'clock at Island Place here in Wausau. 10 o'clock Sunday morning, Island Place. A simple service. The Holy Communion music and the word of god verse by verse that's island place 10 o'clock sunday morning oak island right here in wassa i'm with you monday through friday at 9 a.m until tomorrow then this is michael moret for scripture verse by verse so long everyone and stay tuned for more than a game coming up next <laughs>